2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 17. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Good evening, everybody. Pastor Mike here. Um, welcome to the Mosaic Recovery Community Ministry. I'm excited. Um, we made it through the new year. The world didn't blow up. We're entering into 2021. And we're entering in with hope, right? We understand that everything that happened in the year 2020, it was bad, right? It was rough, but it was all to prepare us for what God wants to do in 2021, right? I won't sit here and say that just because another day has passed and we're entering into a new year, that everything is gonna magically disappear and everything is gonna be all right. That may not be the case. But what I am going to say is that God has shown us some hope, right? And we have hope that 2021 can and has the potential to be better than 2020 was. We have the hope that everything that happened in 2020 is now preparing us for what God wants to do in 2021. And so I'm excited that you're here. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be able to share this um, message of hope with you guys. Um, as you know, we're in our series of um, recovering our identity, and tonight we're going to be talking about step seven. But before we get into step seven, I just want to um, say that, you know, Reggie always comes on here and say, hey, my Pastor Mike is the Michael Jordan of this recovery ministry. And, and that may be true, but what I want him to understand and I want everybody to understand is that a good leader is only as good as the people that he has on his team. Let me say that again. A good leader is only as good as the people that he has on his team. A good leader knows that the responsibility that he or she has is to raise up other leaders. That's it. It's not about being out front. It's not about being the best. It's not about, it's not about being Michael Jordan. It's about being able to raise up other leaders that they would then go out and raise up other leaders. That is the perfect or that is the best quality of a good leader is to be able to recognize the importance of raising up other leaders that they would go out and to raise up other leaders. And so in keeping with the basketball analogy, right, uh, the big man feed me now, you know, so I'm coming behind him. Right. We know that um, every good player. Right. Uh, in order for them to be good, they have to have a, a, a great big man. Right. Um, Kobe had Shaq. You know, um, Maggie Johnson had Kareem, uh, Clyde Drexler had Akeem Olajuwon. And so I get Reggie and Reggie is a great big man. And there's no other person that I would um, have to feed me to rock out on a three point line so I can drain that jumper. Amen. So with that being said, let us get started. We're going to be talking about um, or talking through step seven. And, and step seven says we humbly ask him to remove our uh, shortcomings. Now, remember I always told you to pay careful attention to what you're reading, right? Because in order for you to get the meat or in order for you to get um, the full meaning of what's being said, you have to understand what you're reading. So it says, we humbly asked him with a capital H. This is referring to God, right? Again, anytime you see a pronoun um, capitalized, right? It's referring to God. Anytime you see the word God with a capital G, it's referring to God, right? Our higher power, whom we like to call Jesus Christ, right? They're um, all one and the same. You know, the three persons of the Trinity, God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. And so we'll get into that in a minute. But um, first, I wanted to ask, have you ever heard the phrase, be humble or be humiliated? be humble or be humiliated. Now, I first heard this phrase at an NA meeting 
and, and I thought it was real cool, right? I, I didn't put much thought into it, but I just thought that it was a cool little slogan or whatever, right? And, and um, it says, to be humbled or be humiliated. And when you think about it, it makes perfect sense, right? It, isn't this how it usually goes, right? When we start thinking we're more than, than what we really are, we start thinking too highly of ourselves. God then brings us back to reality. The Bible puts it like this in Proverbs 16 and 18. Pride always comes before the fall, right? This is a reminder to us to recognize where our help comes from. Right. How how can we do the things that we are able to do? Right. And, and why we're standing on solid ground instead of sinking sand. Right. Humility helps us to recognize that it's not by our doing, but it's by God's doing. Right. By his grace, by his mercy, by his compassion, by his patience, by his forgiveness. It's the only reason that you and I are alive today. It is because he chose to die so that we could live. God chose to deliver us from our humiliation and give us a new way to live. And humility helps us give credit where credit is due. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to go into It Works How and Why um, and just share a little bit about what the book says about step seven. And so in the first paragraph on page 69 and It Works How and Why, it says, in step four, we uncovered the basic defects of our character. In step five, we admitted their existence. In step six, we became entirely ready to have them removed so that we could experience continued spiritual growth and recovery. Now, in step seven, we humbly ask our higher power to remove our shortcomings. When we ask our higher power to remove these shortcomings, we ask for freedom from anything which limits our recovery. We ask for help because we cannot do it alone. Now, I was talking with Reggie, and, and he was saying that there was something different this time than the last times that he went through the recovery process. Now, now even for myself, right, the many times I went through this process of trying to get myself together, only to find myself doing the same thing over and over again and getting the same results, right? Both he and I agreed that it wasn't until we completely surrendered everything to God that we were able to fully engage in this recovery process, right? Until we were able to humble ourselves and admit that we were powerless over our inability to do the right thing, powerless over our shortcomings, um, and, and if we were to be who God intended for us to be, that we would have to admit this. We would need God's help or it would never happen. Now, can I just say the hardest thing for an idiot to do is to admit that they don't have all of the answers? Now, now, don't worry. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about myself, see, because I could be the biggest idiot that I know, right? I don't know about your life, but I know about mine. And I know that when I think that I have all the answers, when I think that I don't need God's help, that's when I become the biggest idiot that I know. Paragraphs two on page 69 of it works how why says, an attitude of humility is not the same as humiliation, nor is a denial of our good qualities. On the contrary, an attitude of humility means that we have a realistic view of ourselves and our place in the world. In the seventh step, humility means understanding our role in our own recovery, appreciating our strengths and limitations and having, a, and having faith in a power greater than ourselves. Now, let me just say this. Being humble, having an attitude of humility is not a sign of weakness. So many of us believe that if we start admitting our limitations and our need for help, that it's a sign of weakness. Humility, my friends, is a sign of strength. Admitting our limitations and our need for help is a powerful thing. See, when we do this, in doing so, we posture ourselves to receive um, from God what we all desperately need, and that's his help. I don't care if you were baptized by the Holy Spirit or sanctified and too blessed to be stressed, right? We all need God's help in some area of our lives. Recognizing this takes humility. Not recognizing it will eventually lead to our humiliation. Now... 
I'm here to tell you, Superman, I'm here to tell you, Superman, Superwoman, that at some point you're going to have to realize that you can't carry a refrigerator by yourself. At some point you're going to have to realize that every time you try to pick that refrigerator up by yourself, there's a sharp pain in your back and that means stop and get some help. Now, I don't know who I'm talking to out there, but there's so many of us out there trying to carry refrigerators by ourselves. You know, it's just a bunch of people out here walking around hunched over with pains in their back from trying to carry these refrigerators by themselves. And God said, look, Superman, look, Superwoman, stop. I gave you a dolly. I've given you help. Now use it. That's not being weak. That's being smart. What are you carrying by yourself that you need to get help with? What is your refrigerator? Page 70 of It Works How and Why in paragraph 3 says, We tried so hard to get it right. We were tired of our shortcomings. We were worn out from trying to manage and control them, and we wanted some relief. Oddly enough, this is precisely the attitude we hope to demonstrate in step 7. The attitude of humility. We admit defeat, recognize our limitations, and ask God, and ask help from the God of our understanding. At some point, brothers and sisters, we're going to have to throw our hands up and say, that's it. I've had enough. I've tried everything I could and none of it worked. At some point, we're going to have to admit that I can't, but God, you can now, it's not until we get out of the way and let God work in our lives that he will work in our lives. Let me say that again. It's not until we get out of the way and let God work in our lives that he will work in our lives. Now, I know we all think we can do it better than God, right? I know we all think we know what's best and have the best way to do things. Right. And I know we, we need to just go sit ourselves some down somewhere and let God work. Right? I could just imagine God sitting up in heaven saying to Jesus and Holy Spirit, look at these clowns out here trying to carry refrigerators by themselves. Look at them walking around with these refrigerators on their backs and I've given them a dolly. Just picture God, he who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Without your help, he who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them without your help. Would you picture him needing your help? God who spoke and the earth was formed. God who speaks and the waves stand still. God, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the all eternal, all sufficient God. Just picture him needing your help. You and I, we're not smart enough to help God help us. You and I, we're not smart enough to let to help God help us. If we're honest, we don't even know the areas of our lives that we need help the most, right? Most of us just want to pick up our mat and go home, right? We just want to be healed from our physical illness. But God is saying, I want to heal your spirit. I want to heal your sins, right? You just want to be free from addiction, right? You just want to be free from your shortcoming. But God wants to free you from the root cause of these addictions and these shortcomings. We're running around here asking God to keep us from smoking when we need to be asking him to keep us from sinning. We need to humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. And the reason why we ask him is because he's the only one who can. I know you want to stop drinking. You want to stop using drugs, right? But the problem ain't the drugs. The problem ain't the drink. The problem is you and your shortcomings. The problem is me and my shortcomings, right? It's the sin in our lives and it's the other stuff that's just a byproduct of the sins and the shortcomings in our lives. Now this goes for me. This goes for you. This goes for anyone listening to this message. This is the reality that you're faced with. This is the reality that I'm faced with daily. What I'm really doing is just letting you in on a conversation that God and myself had, right? A long time ago on a conversation that we have on a continuous basis. Now, can I just be honest for a moment? Can, can you be honest for a moment? There's some stuff you and I have forgotten about that has kept us in bondage for years. We've been wondering why we respond to certain things the way we do, 
right? There's some stuff going on within us that only the Holy Spirit can remove. We need to ask God to humbly remove those things. On page 72, paragraph 4, it says, One of the changes we see in our relationship with the God of our understanding. Previously, we may have felt that God was far removed and did not have much to do with us on a personal level. We may have had trouble grasping the fact that each one of us could have a God of our understanding always available to us. Prayer may have felt artificial for quite a while, but we may now sense that we are being listened to and loved when we pray. Developing a relationship with the God of our understanding goes a long way towards increasing our level of comfort when we ask to have our shortcomings removed. I know a lot of this stuff that I'm saying is hard to hear, right? It was hard for me to hear, but I hope you're listening, right? Because without the relationship, none of this will make sense. Without the relationship, none of this will make sense. Without the relationship, none of this will make sense. It's just words. But with the relationship, these words have the power to change our lives. With the relationship, these words have the power to change our lives. We humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. Humility positions us to enter into a relationship with God. Humility positions us to enter into a relationship with God. A relationship that gives God a license to work in our lives. Now, turn with me to Psalm 51, 1 and 19. Psalm 51, 1 and 19. And while you're turning there, I'm just going to pray real quick over this message. Father God, we thank you for what you have given us so far. And we thank you for what you're preparing to give us. We pray, Father God, that these words, that they would penetrate our heart, that they would pierce our heart, that they would convict us in a way that we would be forced to respond in, in, in obedience. We pray that these words would be transforming in our lives. We pray that you would be glorified by the transformation that happens in our lives. We pray for the humility to come before your throne of grace and mercy and humbly ask you to remove our shortcomings and the sin that's within us, Father God. We pray that you would make us more like you. And as we grow in our identity in Christ, that we would be positioned to walk in our purpose, Father God, living out our purpose. May you be glorified in and through all that we do. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. And so uh, Psalms 51, 1 through 19. This is uh, David, right? We, we all know the story of David in um his, his affair with Bathsheba and, and how through this affair with Bathsheba, he uh, had one of his uh, his generals killed in the army. And then he took her on to um, be his wife. You know, she got pregnant behind all of that, had a baby, the baby died. And so now um, David, fully aware of the sin of his life in his life, fully aware of his shortcomings, he comes to God and, 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 and laments, right? He comes to God and and, and, and ask him to cleanse him. He comes to God and asks him to remove not only his sin, but his shortcomings and his defects of character. So here's what David says. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say. And your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner. And your for I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb. Purify, purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Created me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels, 
for they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God, who saves me. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. You do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. Look with favor on Zion and help her. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with sacrifices offered in the right spirit, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be again sacrificed on your altar. Now, we all know that David was a man of God, right? We know he was chosen by God to be the greatest king Jerusalem had ever seen. He was chosen to have Jesus come from his lineage. He was called a man after God's own heart. And even with all of this going on for him, David, even David had some defects of character. David had some shortcomings. Now, it would be safe to say that, um, that, that David lived out a lot of these defects of characters and his shortcomings. And that's what got him into the situation that he is now. Right, we understand that David was an adulterer. We understand that he was a murderer. We understand that he was a lustful man, right? David was a deceitful man. David was selfish. David had some stuff going on in his life. But even with all of this stuff going on in his life, he knew that the only way he would be cleansed of these things was if God cleansed him. We understand that David was a great man. He was a man of might and power. He was a well-respected man. He was a feared man. We understand that David could, could have anything he wanted at any time. But he knew with all that he was, he was nothing without God. He knew that as great as he was, God was greater. And so when it came time to be cleansed, he knew he had to ask God to cleanse him. As mighty and as powerful as he was, he knew he had to humble himself before God or live in humiliation. Oh. He had to confess and repent and ask God to remove his shortcomings. Now, I'm here to tell you that if you don't humble yourself before God and ask him to remove your shortcomings, your shortcomings will forever humiliate you. Let me say that again. If we don't humble ourselves before God and ask God to remove our shortcomings, our shortcomings will forever humiliate us. Like David, we must ask God to cleanse us from within. We must ask him to fill our hearts and our spirits with new thoughts and desires. Only through the cleansing of our hearts and our desires will our conduct and our behavior and our thinking change. Only through this cleansing will our shortcomings be removed. Until we humble ourselves before God and ask him to remove our sins and our shortcomings, our sins and our shortcomings will forever humiliate us. Through humility, we recognize we have a problem and we bring those problems before God. This is confession. Then we ask God to remove them and we turn from them and we turn towards him. This is repentance. We understand that David suffered physical consequences for his actions, but he was cleansed and he was made righteous. You and I, we may have to pay for our actions and we will not always escape physical or natural consequences, but if we ask for forgiveness, God is just to forgive our sins, remove our shortcomings, and make us righteous in his sight. I want to encourage you to humbly ask God to remove your shortcomings or forever be humiliated by him. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you for this message. I thank you for these words. I pray, Father God, that there's someone listening right now that this message resonates with. And they say, you know what? Enough is enough. I'm washing my hands. I've done all that I can do. I've tried everything that I can try in my own power. I've been walking around with a refrigerator on my back and I'm near about ready to collapse. Take the refrigerator off our backs, Father God. Give us insight and wisdom to use the tools that you have made ready for us 
to help us walk through this process of recovery. Let us realize that we cannot do this alone. It takes community with each other. It takes relationship with you in order for us to be who you intended for us to be. Help us to see that humility is a sign of strength. And when we come to you with humble hearts, we remove the humiliation of our sins and of our shortcomings and of our past. And we are made new in your likeness, Father God. Help us to walk in this newness, being the men and women that you have intended for us to be from the beginning. And I ask all these things in the matchless name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. And so I hope that this message, um, it really touched somebody today. Um, I know it ministered to me. Um, like I, I just pray that you will continue to engage, continue to um, lean in, continue to trust God, continue to trust the process. Um, humble yourselves before God or be humiliated. Until we meet again, stay in recovery.